Welcome to Eagle Point Community Bible Church. My name is David Swim. I'm a local teacher who stayed here for over 30 years teaching middle school students and got to retire. So I'm enjoying my retirement. I'm married to Michelle. She's right back there. Been married 32 years. She says they're very happy. <laughs> we had, have three children. Kiana, she's in medical school. And Kristen, who is an MA, working for Asante. And Callie, who was born with one of those warning labels from God, red hair. <laughs> and she is working uh, also in the medical field. Uh, enjoyed those 30 years with the middle school. I got 15 of those years I got to work with Dick Kendrick up at Shady Cove School. And you might know him. He would probably rate our working together as one and a half thumbs up. And uh, he, he convinced me along the way. We decided that boating would probably be a good thing to do with our kids because we want them, their kids to come to us and enjoy our time together. And uh, so we chose boating. And when Dick found out I had a ski boat, then I was recruited to pull middle schoolers behind the boat on tubes. And that's pretty good therapy for middle school teachers in the summertime to have your hand on a throttle of a V8 and a kid's 75 feet back there. And I'll guarantee it helped them in their prayer life. I could hear them back there praying like crazy. But I was pretty much, I was uh, uh, raised up in a Christian family. Uh, Nazarene Church, we started off actually in the Grange building over there until we built up on the hill. I remember being, uh, accepting the Lord in my heart when I was a young man and being baptized in a swimming pool in December. So there was probably some extra points for that one. So, without further ado, please join us in praise. Thank you, David. And thank you for being here with us. If you wouldn't mind standing and joining us as we sing, it would be wonderful. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Holy is the Lord Holy 
no more Come on you sinners Come find His mercy Come to the table He will satisfy Taste of His goodness Find what you're looking for For God so Till my 
my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown In that old rugged cross Stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see on that old rugged cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross
my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus oh Jesus and oh I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough and nothing compares to your embrace light of the world Father, we are so thankful to be here with you today. It is such an honor to be able to glorify you through song, through your word, through fellowship with one another. And we are thankful that we have a safe place to do so without persecution, that we can gather here and we can meet with you, we can draw close, and we know that your love will sustain us. And so, Father, we thank you for your outpourings upon our lives the blessings you have bestowed upon us and have promised to us. We look forward with hope to the everlasting life that we get to live with you. And until then, Father, we pray that this service and every day forth as we surround ourselves with believers would help us to have the courage and the faith to boldly go forth and proclaim your love and your truth until that hope has come. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good to be with you all. I missed being with you last week. My family and I took a little trip up to Washington to see some friends and some family up there. Hopefully we were able to catch Norm's message on the gospel. That just fits perfectly in where we're at in Galatians. Uh, So speaking of Galatians, if you're new this morning, we are going through the New Testament. We find ourselves this morning in Galatians chapter 2. If you have a Bible, uh, awesome. Turn it to Galatians chapter 2. If you don't, there's a red one probably in the row in front of you. If you want to look at your phone, iPad, that's great. If you're new here, we want to connect with you. Uh, My name is Mike. I'm the pastor and would love to meet you briefly after the service, set up a time we can get coffee, talk about ways we can connect with you in, uh, uh, with the goal of getting you plugged in for you to use your gifts and talents to serve within this body, but also so that we can better minister to you. So hopefully that can go both ways. While you guys are getting open to Galatians chapter 2, a couple things I just want to bring you up to speed on. If I can get to the right page of my notes here. Uh, I know this isn't funny, but it's kind of funny. Uh, some, somebody continues to make email addresses like mine asking for gift cards. It's not me. Don't. I, I'm not going to email you asking you to take pictures of gift cards and send them to me. Uh, we'll leave it at that. There's a men's retreat coming up. We still have a couple extra spots for the last weekend of this month. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, you can just grab me after the service or anybody on the men's leadership team. They can get you signed up for that. We are growing specifically in our kids' Sunday morning service times. And so right now, our third to fifth grade class is running 20 to 30 kids. And that is too much to effectively minister to kids. We, we can do daycare. We're not in the business of daycare here. We're in the, minist- in the, in, in the business of making disciples. And so we want to do that from, from nursery through the elderly, all, everything in between. So if you 
could pray through what it might look like for you to get involved in serving, hopefully once every six to eight weeks in the back to specifically in that third to fifth grade. There's a sign up out in the lobby. Would love to have you kind of use your gifts for that. Uh, the last thing is um, Lent started this last Wednesday. Um, so I know typically in the uh, maybe non-denominational or more or less reformed Protestant world, we don't make a real big deal of Lent, but I like Lent. I like Lent because I don't like Lent. I, 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 I want to focus on Lent because in my Western Christian male mind, it's the last thing I want to think about. I do not in any way, shape, or form want to consider and ponder and lament my sin. I'm happy to talk about your sin all day long. <laughs> like, or their, their sin. Like, like, that's my mind, is let me tell you how much better I'm doing than them, not, Lord, I recognize you went to the cross because of me and my sin. Now, I don't want to do this in a way that I sense condemnation or shame. That, that is not the gospel. But we have this practice that I think goes back to about the second or third century where we say, leading up to uh, uh, remembering Christ's death burial and resurrection, that he did that for Mike Bull, and to just ponder the, the cost of my own sin. And so I hope uh, that you're finding out some ways to fast or remember that, do those sorts of things. I say that because leading up to Easter, Easter is going to be a cool celebration here. We'll remember the resurrection of our Savior. And his resurrection means we in Christ become resurrected. And actually, the whole cosmos gets resurrected. This is good news, but it's such good news, we know lots of extra people come on Easter. And so we're going to do two services. It's going to be an 8 a.m. No Sunday morning services for children, but we're going to have an 8 a.m. service, and then there'll be a 10 a.m. service where we also offer kids' services in the back. So just, you'll be planning on that, and in the weeks leading up to that, we're actually going to start doing our kids' a uh, little time up front here, probably about the last four weeks leading up to Easter. So I'm excited about that. Hopefully that gave you enough time to get to Galatians 2, because that's where we're at. Much like watching a TV show, at the beginning, I want, to, I want to give you an update as to what has happened and what is happening. So if this is your first time to church in like 10 years, you kind of have a, a context to fit this in. Galatians is a letter written by Paul to a, a group of churches in southern and middle Turkey, modern-day Turkey. And this is not an, necessarily an uplifting letter. So Paul had visited these churches on one of his missionaries' journeys. He shared the gospel. They came alive to the gospel. They accepted Christ as their only means of being justified before the Father. Paul leaves, and some people come along and say essentially this. It's great that you've accepted Christ. Now you need to become Jewish. If, if you really want to be justified before God and the Father, it is Christ plus the law. And so Paul starts out this letter with this very tense opening, and he goes right into condemnation. Who do you think you are? I'm appalled that you've bought into this false gospel. And those that teach this gospel, and this false gospel is anathema, it is eternally damned. He does not pull any punches in Galatians. And then as we go into the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2, as you might expect, there's some questions like, what is your gospel? And who are you to even tell us what we know? We're, we're the Judaizers from James and Jerusalem. Like, you're just some random dude traveling around the Middle East. No. Paul says in the rest of chapter 1 and chapter 2, let me tell you where my gospel came from and that it is independent from any human teaching, any Judean churches. And he's going to go on today and he's independent from the pillars of the faith back in Jerusalem and specifically Peter. That's the rest of chapter 2. And we're going to get this foundational statement that most of Galatians is built on, that we are justified by faith through Christ apart from works of the law. That's, that's kind of where we're going this morning. As we look ahead a little bit, we get some indicatives of the faith in chapter 3 and 4, and we get the imperatives of the faith in 5 and 6. Basically, Paul is going to go on to say, and here is what tr is true about you as you've been justified before the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. You've received the Spirit. You have sonship. You are heirs to the kingdom. And then the, the, the imperatives are, now you go live in freedom in the Spirit. And you, you work through these gifts of the Spirit, not the desires of the flesh any longer. You are new, start acting like it. That is the book of Galatians in like a 30-second overview. And this is perfect because there's a TV commercial that is just like blends so well into, uh, into this conversation. And... Uh, I don't know if you guys watched the Super Bowl. Who, I'm curious. Who, who here watched the Super Bowl? Like half. Okay. 
Cool. So as long as you didn't watch the halftime show, we won't have to get any prayer over you. Uh, and if you did know the words to any of Usher's songs, like there's going to be a special prayer room that I will be leading in the back afterwards. Uh, anyways, Lynette, let's go ahead and play this commercial. Yeah, so that, that should elicit something. <laughs> let's talk about that. Who here, b- before coming this morning, who here has had any interaction with this commercial? I was expecting more than that. That's interesting. Uh, I know our screens are not jumbotrons, so I'm going to just walk through this in case you were in the back. You didn't bring your glasses this morning. He Gets Us uh, is the name of the campaign that put this commercial out. It played, I don't know, during the first quarter of the Super Bowl, which roughly half of America watched. So this was a pretty well-watched commercial. Uh, Let me just take you through it. The opening scene is a young adult washing an elderly man's feet, uh, then a Hispanic police officer washing a young black man's feet, a cheerleader-type white girl washing an alternative white girl's looking feet, an older white rancher washing an older Native American's feet, Uh, a white woman picketing an abortion clinic washing a woman's uh, feet that's visiting the clinic, a younger woman washing an older addict-looking woman's feet, an old white oil roughneck washing a young Asian environmentalist's feet, uh, put together middle-aged white woman washing a young immigrant woman's feet, a suburban white woman-looking person uh, washing a Middle Eastern Muslim-looking woman's feet, Young black women washing a young Hispanic woman's feet. An older white and black man sharing a foot washing basin appearing as friends. That was my favorite, by the way. Um, And then an older white priest washing a very effeminate looking black man's feet. Cut to the text. Jesus didn't teach hate. He washed feet. He gets us, all of us, Jesus. I'm guessing this stirred you in some way. If you didn't then Tin Man, you can leave now. Uh, the, the, but, but what I'm going to say is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to break this. We'll just break this like down in half here. Is I'm going to say there was some portion of, of people that saw that and they said, no, thank you. <laughs> that, that missed it, actually. And I'm going to assume that's this half of the room. And, and there's another portion of people that see that and because of their theological bent and their, maybe their life circumstances, we'll call them y'all, uh, you loved it. And it really stirred you in a way they're like, yes and amen. And I, I'm just going to point out the fact that, that my Pharisees over here, like you probably have some things that, that you lean towards being a judgmental Pharisee on. And, I, and I'm going to say the people over here, you probably have a coffee, coffee cup that says like, you are not enough. And you're just like content to look at that a lot. And so I'm going to generalize and I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to make some broad statements. And I, I get that not everyone here and here didn't like or likes. Or I want to talk about this for a minute because I think this plays well into Galatians. What to affirm those that love this commercial. Jesus and his gospel are for all. Full stop. Every person in that commercial that was on their knees or getting their foot washed the effeminate-looking gay man, the woman visiting the abortion clinic, the immigrant, you name it, the gospel is for them. Jesus is for them. Those that didn't like it. (laughs) The gospel message is exclusive to those that accept Christ as their Savior. And that demands change. I get that. For those that loved it, Per the words of those involved in this campaign, it is pre-evangelism, which is often helpful and necessary, and we see aspects of this in Jesus' own ministry. We see that through John the Baptist. I would say we see that through the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus miraculously healing people, that sometimes you've got to do something in order for the gospel to get heard. I, I recognize that. For those that didn't like it, I also understand that the most effective and biblical way to do pre-evangelism was in the words of repent, the kingdom of God is near. And the word repent or sin was nowhere in this ad campaign. Uh, Those that loved it, it's intentionally provocative. And I like provocative. I think Jesus actually liked provocative. And the immediate outcry from the far left and the far right is usually an indication of something being really biblical. So amen to that. On the flip side, it's provocative in a way that primarily provokes those with a full understanding of the gospel and leaves those living in darkness unchanged. 
I like the fact that it pushes people to their website, and then it gives them a fuller biblical message. It attempts to connect them with a local church and provides biblical reading plans to get people reading God's word to find out who Jesus really is. I love that. However, on the website, there is still no mention of sin, God's judgment, or Jesus' radical calls for obedience to be found there. It's a problem. I get that. Jesus, for those that love this, yes, Jesus did wash feet. And as a model of humble, servant-hearted love. Yes and amen. <laughs> to the Pharisees, he also modeled how to offend, clear a temple, rebuke, show anger, and hate sin. All as a model of love. I get that Jesus never taught hate. And his ethic was primarily always an ethic of love. Love for God and love for our neighbors. We can celebrate that. I also get that we are called to hate what is evil and cling to what is good, according to Romans 12.9. He does get us. If by get, we mean he understands us, he recognizes us, and he is familiar with our condition. All of those are true. If that's what we mean by get, listen, he understands our weakness and temptation according to Hebrews 4.15. He recognizes what the human condition is like according to Philippians chapter 2. And he's familiar with suffering, oppression, sorrow, rejection, and death according to Isaiah 53. All that's is true. He gets us if that's what we're talking about. But if what we're talking about is he primarily came to affirm who we are, No. Absolutely not. Did he come to save us from oppression? No. Is our atonement from systems of power or powerful people? No. Not at all. I don't know if you picked up on the critical theory flavors flowing through this commercial, but it's being softly peddled. In most every case, it is an oppressive, culturally looking person washing the feet of the oppressed. And while that is every bit true, the gospel is for all, not just the oppressed. And we need to see through this critical theory flavor and recognize, I'm going to just quote Neil Shenvey here, our fundamental problem is sin in which we all equally stand condemned before God. The good news is of Jesus, the good news of Galatians, is that he made a way for our sins to be forgiven but in order to do so, we all have to respond in faith. Nothing more, nothing less. This is the message to the church of Galatians. I love how Matt Chandler has a saying. Uh, he's a pastor in Texas. He says, the gospel is all of life for all of life. And I would add to that, for all human life. And here's what I mean by that. The gospel is for all human life. There is no one too elite and no one too oppressed to not need or be below the gospel. It is for every human, irregardless of any status. All right? And it's for all of life. The gospel is not a one-time mental ascent and then you're good. We're going to see that today with Peter and Paul. The gospel is not checking a box and moving on. It's for the duration of life. And it's for every aspect of life. It's your money it's your time, it's your resources, it's your sexuality, it's your pride. It is all of life, for all of life, for all human life. I don't know that this ad campaign portrays that effectively. If it's pre-evangelism, great. If you love it, praise God you're here. If you hate it, praise God you're here. Hopefully we can clear up some of the nuances as we go through this text. Ultimately, I wanna, I wanna just lead into the text with this. That if we have some impression of Jesus sitting at our feet, wash basin and towel in hand, groveling for him to be a part of our lives, we have missed the gospel and we've missed Jesus. The message of the New Testament, the message of the gospel is not ultimately that he can become a little part of our lives if we let him. The message of the gospel, the message of the New Testament is that we can become part of Jesus' life and his kingdom. We get to become one with him not him getting added in as a bonus feature to our life. That is an essential twist on this American understanding of inviting him into our little hearts versus us bending the knee to King Jesus and becoming part of his kingdom. Galatians chapter 2. 
Let's start with 1 through 10. 14 years later, I went up against, uh, again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Jesus Christ and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seemed to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearances. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Here, Paul is continuing his proof that his gospel was independent from any human teaching, any churches, and here are the pillars in Jerusalem, and specifically that his gospel source was divine revelation from Jesus Christ. This is roughly 14 years since his conversion. It's 10 years since we left in chapter 1. This is what's been going on. In 1 through 3, verses 1 through 3, we see Paul present his message, and he tells, this is an important little key point here. He tells who went along with him to Jerusalem to present his gospel understanding to the pillars in Jerusalem. And he brings Barnabas. It literally means son of encouragement. This was not his given name. His parents didn't name him this. His name was Joseph. But the apostles actually changed his name to Barnabas. He was a Jew. He was also the cousin of John Mark. Later in Paul's ministry, he and Barnabas have a pretty significant split, but they end up coming back together. Titus was the other co-companion of Paul when he goes back to visit Jerusalem. And, and this is actually where things get interesting. You see, Titus was a Greek. And as Paul and Barnabas and, uh, and Titus, they go back to Jerusalem. He says something unique about Titus, that in his message, even the pillars in Jerusalem did not compel Titus to get circumcised. Now, if you were here in the last few weeks when I was teaching this, circumcision was a big deal to give you a boundary marker of what it looked like to be Jewish. And they had scripture to back that up from Genesis 12 and 17. But according to Paul's gospel, you did not need to become Jewish. You did not need to adhere to the Mosaic law to become Christian. And this is significant that the, the pillars in Jerusalem agree with this. Paul is emphasizing that while his gospel was not from the Jerusalem leaders, it was in complete alignment with the Jerusalem leaders. We mentioned this as a key point to all of Galatians, is that the gospel that was now spreading from this tiny little outpost in the Middle East, being Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world, was not a diverse gospel. That heresy did not precede orthodoxy. Orthodoxy was from the very beginning. So you see this gospel of spreading is not, here's how you get saved, and you got to become Jewish if you live in Palestine, but you don't have to become Jewish. No, the gospel was the same no matter where the movement spread. Paul's pointing this out. In verses 4 and 5, Paul relates that what was happening in Galatia was exactly what happened to them in Jerusalem. The Judaizers were coming along, spying on their freedom and saying, this is not right. He calls them false brothers. That anything, Paul says, anything that minimizes the work of Christ on the cross or undermines the effectiveness of the Spirit is putting people, as he says, into slavery. Why would you go become a slave again to the law? Why would you minimize the work of Christ to say it's Christ plus the law? Verses 6 through 10, the Jerusalem leaders actually endorse Paul's gospel. If this seems odd that Paul went through this entire proof in chapter 1 to show the independence of his gospel, he's not walking that back now. He's trying to say that his source was independent, but the gospel message was in complete alignment with the Jerusalem leaders. 
It says they gave him the right hand of fellowship. Literally, that means they gave him public acknowledgement before the Jews that yes, this man's message that the Gentiles can come to saving faith, to be legally justified, righteous before God through Jesus Christ, that is enough. They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need the food laws. They don't need to become adherents to the Mosaic law. Christ was enough. This is prior to the Jerusalem council that we see in Acts 15. This would all get kind of written into code in Acts 15, but this is prior to that. So they had an understanding going forward. There's one gospel agreed upon by all the apostles. I want you to take away from these first 10 verses. There was one gospel. There still is one gospel. This does not change. That justification by faith in Christ is the gospel at its core. And we could unpack that a little more. Well, what about Christ, his death, burial, resurrection? Yeah, what, what exactly is faith? We're going to get into that today. But specifically, that it was available to all. This is where I think this actually plays with that commercial well. It was available to all. Paul's going to talk about this a little bit more in the end of chapter 3, where he says, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. When, he, when Paul says that, he's saying there's no difference between those. That's a He's not saying there's no gender anymore, no race anymore, or you don't have heritage, whether being Gentile or... He's not saying that. He's saying there's one gospel pertaining to all people. If you've had an abortion here, this gospel's for you. Right? I mean, if, if you've picketed or spewed hate towards people that have had an abortion, this gospel's for you. Paul, do we forget who Paul was from three weeks ago? Paul was a murderer. He was literally a murderer. He stand by and like put a stamp of approval on Stephen being stoned. The gospel is for all. Verses 11 through 14. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So that we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Here, we're taking it from people in general to the Judean churches, to the pillars. Now we're really focusing in who many would say was the leader of the Christian church at that time. This was Peter. Well, just give, if, if, if you've not grown up understanding who Peter is, let me just give you a little background on Peter. Peter was one of the first disciples, and he was that friend that you sometimes were a little sketched to hang out with because you didn't know what he was going to say or do. So Peter had these high, high moments, and then he had these low, low moments. We see this with abundant faith and then total cowardice. We see Peter make statements of faith before any of the other disciples, like, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And almost in the same breath, Jesus has to tell him to get out of his way, Satan, when Peter promises that, that Jesus wouldn't go and die. He's the man who walked on water, and he's the man who ran away and denied even knowing Jesus. Man, Peter's testimony, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, Peter's testimony was that more of a glacier? You guys remember testimonies, how how there's no such thing as an unpowerful testimony. And Paul had this volcanic kind, kind of come to Jesus on the road to Emmaus, goes from complete sinner to like this holy apostle in just this moment. And, and we know people like that. We know people that have these radical testimonies in life. And we call those, like, I'll call those like a volcano testimony. And then we have people that have a testimony that's more like a glacier and just kind of creeps along, creeps along. But looking back at a volcano or a glacier, they both move massive amounts of earth. So there's not like one testimony that's effective and one that's not. They just look different. And Peter's is going to look way different than Paul's. So Peter, after Jesus ascends 
back in heaven, Peter basically starts leading the church and he's a powerful force. And one day he's told to go sleep on this roof and this sheet is lowered with all this unclean food. And, and, P- and the Lord basically tells him, hey, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he's like, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat that stuff. I never have, Lord. And the Lord's like, no, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. And, and, and the point of this story with Peter is not only that, that the dietary laws are no longer in effect, but it's actually that Gentiles are no longer to be seen as unclean. Because the first thing Peter does is he goes and he visits Gentiles and he sees the Spirit come upon them. All this happens. Eventually, Peter is driven out of Jerusalem, running for his life, and he ends up in Antioch. And what does he do in Antioch? He settles down in the church where people were first called Christians. He starts hanging out at their table with them eating, fellowshipping, literally doing Acts 2. Man, praying, reading the apostles' teaching, fellowshipping, and eating. This, this was the Christian church in the first century. This was a big deal because never before would you ever see mixed races, mixed genders, people like that coming together and fellowshipping around food. And the Greeks wouldn't be caught dead having lunch with a slave. Romans wouldn't be caught dead having lunch with a slave. Jews wouldn't be caught dead having lunch with a Roman or a Greek. And you would never eat with a tax collector and a prostitute and a business. You would never see that. And here are the first early church. That's what they're doing. They're gathering around the table. I want to read you, like, if you want a picture of what the first century church was like, we have this letter written in 130. It was the letter to Diognatius. I would highly recommend we all read this letter. I'm going to read you just a blip out of this letter of this first century person trying to explain Christianity to this man named Diognasius. He's like, these guys will blow your mind. And, and it's this beautiful letter. I'm just going to take a snippet out of it. They marry like everyone else, and they have children. But they do not destroy their offspring. They share a common table, but not a common bed. They exist in the flesh, but they do not live by the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Oh, if we could just say that. They shared a common table, but not a common bed. Man, so here's Peter dining with Gentiles. Man, he's having the bacon. He's hanging out with the Greeks and the Romans and the other Jews because they have something that's far more, more powerful than any human trait. They have Jesus. They are justified and declared righteous before God, and they're hanging out. And then these Judaizers from Jerusalem, these men of James, these circumcision group, they show up. And Peter, out of fear for, I don't know what, his reputation, I'm not sure what, man, then he starts drawing away from that table and just hanging out with the Jews. Because you can't hang out with people that are not right before God. That would make you unclean as a Jew. So Peter draws away. He draws Barnabas away. And he actually says the word is forced, like with violence, starts drawing the other Messianic Jews away from the Gentiles. This, this text is not a matter of Peter varying his ministry methods. This is outright hypocrisy and it is not in alignment with the gospel. This is not a new method. This is theologically damaging to the true gospel. Paul is all about different gospel presentations. He says, when I, was, I become a Jew, when I'm with the Jews, and when I'm the Gentiles, I can become a Gentile. He talks about this in 1 Corinthians 9. But I'll do all things that I might win some for Christ. Paul's got no problem with other methods. He's got problems with things that are actually contradictory to the gospel in the way that we act. The table, which had become a unifying marker of the gospel work in making new people for God, and an offer of the unity in that was now a marker of faith not being sufficient, but needing to become Jewish. All this was, as I said, rooted in fear. So Peter became a hypocrite, literally an intentional contradiction of belief and practice. So Paul comes to him, and he publicly rebukes Peter in front of all the people. If that sounds odd, and that is the most appropriate thing to do when you have a leader that falls into antithetical gospel action. Peter was in sin, and he had to be confronted publicly because he had led the public astray. And, and I just say that as a leader, like we can look around the valley, and I, I'm not going to name names, but I can see examples of churches in our valley in the last 10 years that have done this really effectively. And I can see other examples that have done this really poorly and they try to hide and cover up and protect the reputation of the leader. No, the reputation of the gospel, the reputation of Christ always takes precedent over the reputation of a leader. 
I had to apologize yesterday to a young man. I don't know if he's here. I said something flippantly off the top of my head. I didn't mean it, and he called me on it the next day. Literally, he texted me and said, what do you mean by this? And I had to apologize. I said, you know what? What I said was stupid. Here's what I meant. We don't, like, let's work through that. I don't feel the, ne- the need to declare that to you at all. I'm just giving you an example of something that, that, that was between me and him. I said something foolish, and I needed to walk that back, and I apologized. Now, What the difference is, if I declare something from the pulpit, or if I'm living some way out there, then I deserve public rebuke for that. I don't want us to think that we now need to skip over the Matthew 18, how you go to a brother in sin. But if the brother happens to be a public figure, especially a spiritual leader as a public figure, man, you need to address that to the degree that the heresy has gone south. Now, here's what I would say that for all of us, because we all should be discipling some people. Maybe you're discipling a little group at work. Maybe it's some people on your sports team. Maybe it's your kids and spouse. And when you blow it before those people, that is the circle you need to apologize to if you've sinned before them. Allie and I struggle with this. We, we, we stub our toes in trying to practice this well to our kids because I sin before my family and my family deserves an apology and admittance to that sin. I think... We need to remember that as as Christians. Man, our behavior can have such an impact on the gospel. When our behavior is not in alignment with the gospel, man, it deserves to be recognized before the people that we could have led astray. Leaders matter. You matter. Because we're all leading somebody. As we see Paul talk about your actions were not in alignment with the gospel. I want you to note that the message of the gospel is primarily something we communicate. It is words we speak. It's, it's, it's verbally communicated. It's written down. It's something that we express through words, and yet the actions that we take large, oftentimes speak louder than the words we say. We need to remember that. Whether we think or whether we act, here's the application is that no human marker disqualifies someone from our proclamation of the gospel. And no human human marker of privilege gives someone a shortcut or a cheat code to the gospel. See, Peter was acting like that. Peter was saying, man, because of my fear socially, I need to start acting this way. That you have to become Jewish. You have to obey the Mosaic law to be justified before God. So he wasn't, he might not have been saying that verbally, but he was sure acting that way and promoting that. How do we do that? Are there certain people that are below the gospel in our lives that you say, come on up here, you got to become this for me to share the gospel, for me to live out the gospel before you? I hope not. That would be, that would be out of alignment with the gospel. Or are the people that are born into levels of privilege that are above the gospel? Well, they don't need the full gospel because they're this. They've achieved a level of wealth or athletic ability or they're so funny or they're so popular or they live in a certain zip code or they have a certain nationality or they're a certain race where they don't actually need the full gospel. They're kind of saved by who they already are and as long as they're a good person, they're fine. No, that is not the gospel. No one is below, below and no one is above needing the full gospel. 15 through 21, we're going to see Paul's sort of, as commentators say, this is the theological reflection of what Paul shared with Peter. It is distinctly Jewish, and we have to hold that in mind here. As, as we've talked about in the past weeks, I don't think there's a lot of Judaizers running around Eagle Point right now. I don't, I, I don't know, I've been at Kraken and Stacking many times, no one has come by and, and like looked at my bacon and thought, hmm, you're pastor, really? Like, no, nobody does that. So while well, we have to understand, man, the distinction between Jews and Gentiles in the first century was so powerful. And we're going to have to make this land in, in culturally appropriate ways for us to understand it. So let's, let's talk about it. 15 through 21, we'll read it. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. 
If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroy, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I'm going to divide this into two sections, 15 and 16, and then 17 through 21, because in 15 and 16, we see the facts of a conversion experience, and then in 17 through 21, we see the implications of a conversion experience. So 15 and 16, the facts of a conversion experience, we, we, we start off with this, this statement about Jews and Gentiles. We have to recognize that according to Romans 9, Jews were and are privileged, I'm going to paraphrase it. If you want to go there and read, read Romans 9, 4, and 5. Man, there's where the patriarchs, there's where the law, there's where the covenant. Ultimately, Paul says, and there's where the ancestry from which we got the Messiah, Jesus. They had that privilege, they have that privilege. All right, nothing changes that. And then he goes on to say, and we're, and we're not sinners like the Gentiles. Literally meaning that the Gentiles lacked the law and were sinners outside of God's ethical commands. But get this, both Jew and Gentile alike were dead in their sin without being justified by faith in Jesus. So there is a common conversion experience. Jew, Gentile alike, they come to saving faith through Jesus Christ. Next, both understood that Jesus was the only and had to be the agent of salvation through his work on the cross. Jesus was the agent of salvation. For them to understand that would have been foreign to both the Jew and the Gentile. Both had different reasons why Jesus would have been a stumbling block to them. Going on, their faith in Jesus, who we know assumed our guilt and punishment, was sufficient for being made legally right before God. Legally justified before God. That's what, this word justified, this is a legal term. To say you are declared righteous before the ultimate judge, Jesus. So we are declared righteous by faith in Jesus, not, as Paul said, through works of the law. He's specifically talking to Mosaic, uh, Mosaic law adherents. Side note, Paul has no problem with people obeying the law. Paul was a Jew who lived by the law. Man, as, as an ethnic and cultural marker, that was fine. You don't want any bacon? That's fine. You want to be circumcised? That's fine. You want to go to church on certain days and adhere to certain uh, feasts and different things from the Mosaic Law? That's fine. Just understand that's a cultural, ethnic marker, and that's good. And in no way does that lead to your salvation. So when he says works of the law, he's talking about obedience to the law of Moses. He's not talking about in the Ephesians 2 term where we were created for good works. We're going to get to that. I want to talk about this word faith. We're saved by faith. Literally, this is the necessary response to be declared righteous. Does that sound like we should have a good understanding of this? What is faith? Let me tell you where it starts is this mental ascent of Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's a recognition of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. It's not just Jesus came to save me. It's Jesus came to save me and I get to part, be a part of his kingdom where he is Lord. That, that's where it starts, but faith is not a one-time mental ascent. It's a continual obedience. It's a commitment of obedience. It's both what Paul and Peter had, even though it looked really different. Now, was Peter in faith even though he stumbled into sin? Yeah, he was. And I can tell you from my experience, man, there's been plenty of times where I've backslidden into sin. Praise God for his grace. I'm not here to condemn or shame you or myself, but the point of the matter is, is faith is not a one-time mental ascent that you get to go on and then live the rest of your life. If you guys want to, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> this is called the hall of faith. All right? This gives us examples, human examples, of what faith looks like. Now, tell me if this list sounds familiar. 
a drunk, a liar, a swindler, a murderer, a prostitute, an adulterer. Sounds kind of like that video, right? These were the people in the hall of faith. But they weren't, it doesn't say this, man, by faith Abel or by faith Enoch or by faith Abraham, man, they just understood that God got us and they were good. That's, that's not in here. It's, it's by faith they went and did stuff. What, what did they do? Man, we could just go through the list. You guys should read it. They went and they did this and they went and they did this and they went and they did this. Their faith manifested into action and obedience. They lived it out. That's how they knew it was genuine faith. It was not like, all right, Jesus, I'll take the get out of jail free card. I know you get me. We're good. That is not faith. Faith is you are king of my life and I accept your salvation. Now I'm going to go live for you. Now, how you live and you live and you live and I live, that can look different, but it all needs to be under the banner of King Jesus. <clears throat> the implications of the conversion. This is 17 through 21. First, the life of the Christian is not a lawless life. This would have been the accusations of the Judaizers. If you don't have the law, you're going to go wild out. It's going to be a Super Bowl after party for, for all the Christian church. It, <laughs> the life of the Christian is not a lawless life, but rather we follow Christ through the Spirit. That's the entire book of Galatians. The Judaizers say, well, if you're not adhering to this and this and this, this old Levitical law, like it's going to get wild and crazy and you're going to disparage the name of God. And Paul's saying, no, we're going to have the Spirit indwelling us so we can live in freedom for Christ. It goes on. This, these are very specific to Jewish Christians that the Mosaic law was never to be seen as a means of one accept, one's acceptance before God. And then going on, that we are crucified with Christ. Thus, living for Christ means the law is dead and grace is reigning. These have been shocking words for Messianic Jews. Let me try to bring this home for us today. Are we living in alignment with the gospel? First off, the gospel for all. Do we understand that the gospel is available and needed by all? That there's no one below the gospel? And I, I feel like that ad campaign kind of played in just a lot of like cultural stuff and they actually threw a lot of softballs. Like I was kind of hoping to see a Jewish Christian watching a Palestinian's feet. I was hoping to see a poor homeless man washing a rich banker's feet. I was hoping to see an illegal immigrant washing Donald Trump's feet. Because it goes both ways. It's not just that, that the oppressed need their feet washed by the oppressor. It's, the, the, I mean, it's, it's everybody. It's, we can't fall into thinking that anyone is below or that anyone is above the gospel. Like I said, there's no cheat codes. There's no hacks to being part of the gospel. Like You're not like, well, I was born into this family and my mom and dad are Christians, therefore I was born into the faith. No, you were born dead. No one was born a Christian. No one, no, no one gets that. We are all justified by faith alone through Christ alone. We're not justified by faith in mommy and daddy's name or a privilege. Like, it's none of that. By the same token, there's no one below the gospel. We need to get this and we need to act like it. Do we act like it? You kind of hold your head up a little higher and look down on certain people. Or do you see certain people as beneath the gospel? It is not a one-time mental agreement. It must be ongoing recognition. It's a lifelong commitment of obedience. Paul had this radical transformation on the road to Damascus. And then he went and lived it out. Peter, man, he had this radical time with Jesus. And you see that lived out in obedience. Not perfect obedience, but obedience for many years until he was crucified upside down for Christ. This was not a one-time mental ascent. It's not like, okay, I get it. God, and you get me. We're good. It's a life of obedience. It's, it's longevity. It's for all of life. And it's for every aspect of life. That faith preassumes obedience in every compartment of your life. Again, you're not inviting Jesus into your living room. You're a part of his kingdom. Act like it. 
think like it. Behave in alignment with the gospel. I'm just going to throw some grenades out there. Are you living in alignment with the gospel with money, greed, wealth, material possessions? Are you living in alignment with the gospel with your sexuality? When I looked up on the He Gets Us website, do you know what the number one question asked? The number one question they get at He Gets Us campaign is, what are your thoughts on LGBTQ? And I think that just goes to show the hot button issue that our sexuality is. We're just meant bombarded with this stuff every day in culture, every day around us, from the billboards, the music, to Super Bowl ads, like it's everywhere. And let's also admit that we all have broken sexual desires. It's not the dude with roller skates like, that, that we need to fix. It's all of us. It's Mike Bull, starting with me. Like, we've got things we've got to get under control because if we don't, man, they just manifest into sin. Pride. I've got a pride problem. And am I, am I controlling that for the gospel? Am I submitting my pride to King Jesus? Laziness, sloth, gluttony. Covetousness. Look around at all the things you don't have and you want. The person, the money, the things. You know, there's, the, there's ways to like help yourself with this. Maybe getting off social media might be a start. Actually, getting off social media would probably help with all of these so far. <laughs> if only we had like a 40-day period, we could give something up. Lies, slander, gossip, foul language. Like, how are we honoring, how are we living in alignment with the gospel with the words that we speak? With whatever comes out of your mouth. The jokes, the someone cut you off in traffic, the you're at the water cooler. I don't know what they have in offices these days. I don't know. Like, the drinking fountain, the coffee shop. Like, what are you speaking with your mouth? Is it honoring God? Is it loving your neighbor? Is it, or are you, man, talking about those people on the other side of the political aisle? Like, they're below the gospel talking about the people on your side of that aisle, like we don't really need the full gospel because we're Republicans and you know. See, Jesus did not just come to save us, although he did. He came to be Lord of our lives, Lord of every aspect of our life. He is inviting us into his kingdom where he rules. Are we living like that? So I'm going to encourage you with something. I'm going to encourage you. I know Lent started Wednesday. I know we're going to start recognizing on Sundays, probably in a couple weeks. But I would encourage you to take this season of Lent and consider your own sinfulness. Probably the most un-American thing you could do for the next 40 days is consider your sinfulness. Not in a way that 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 price hasn't been paid. Not in a way that you're not justified. Not in the way that you're under any condemnation at all but in a way that you recognize that Christ went and had to pay for your sins on the cross. There was a price that had to be paid. So I don't know how you guys do that. Maybe, maybe you give something up. Maybe you add something in. I'm not going to put any ash on kids' foreheads when they come up here. I'm not going to go there, although I think there's some biblical references where we could do that. Like I'm just asking you in your heart to examine the sin in your life and give something up so that you can walk more in alignment with the gospel. I was reading in my own Bible reading plans, I was reading through Lamentations this last week. And man, it's just, it's such a broken state of affairs for the people of Israel. It was horrible. They were suffering the consequences from the sin, and yet they were still living in sin. And yet Jeremiah writes this, right smack in the middle. Jeremiah Uh, in in Lamentations 3.21 says, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. One of the church fathers called the season of Lent bright sadness. Because Easter is reality. So are our sins. I, I would encourage you to live 40 days in bright sadness, remembering that we have hope because his mercies never fail and they are new every morning. Let's pray.
Jesus, thank you that there is a way possible that we can stand before God knowing that we are legally righteous, that we are holy before you. And I recognize that I am so far from holy practically. So I'm so thankful for your gospel. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you that you atoned for what I never could through a million years of doing good stuff. Lord, may your goodness generate faithfulness in my life where I live for you, where I actually live out what I say I believe each day, starting with the people closest to me, Lord, going out to this community. May people see glimpses of Jesus through my life. We praise you, God, in your name, amen. short I've got nothing new How could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do But every song must end you never do and so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again cause all that I have is a hallelujah hallelujah I know it's not much but I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one move, with my arms stretched wide. get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord come on my soul don't you get shy
I'll throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's not much. I've nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. As we sing this last song, we pray that, uh, Lord, whatever we're singing about here, this joy, this glory, this excitement, that it would pour forth out into the streets and out into the world as we go forth. And we thank you, Father. Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roar? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing, Christ the saving
Man, I want to I leave here on a high note, and that is the gospel is good news. At, at its core, it is good news. And if you have not accepted the free gift from Jesus for that good news, that he could come and save you from your sins and be Lord of your life, I want you to do that this morning. And I would love to pray with you about that decision, but not that you need me. Your, your salvation in no way goes through me. But I would love to pray with you and encourage you in that. I would love for you to make that decision this morning. So let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ coming into this world that we might have new life in him. I pray if anyone here has not accepted that gift, that they would do that this morning. And I pray for the rest of us, Lord, may we actually live like it as we go out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you.